It's an honor for me to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Rory Cooper. His biography is as long as book, so I have decided to take the challenge of keeping it brief. Dr. Cooper is founding director and VA senior research career scientist of the Human Engineering Research Laboratories. It is also known as HUL, a VA Rehabilitation R&D Center of Excellence in partnership with University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Cooper is FISA and Paralyzed Veterans of America Professor and Distinguished Professor of the Department of Rehabilitation Science and Technology at the University of Pittsburgh. He has authored two books and over 350 peer-reviewed publications. He holds 20 patents. In 2013, Cooper was awarded the International Paralympic Scientific Achievement Award. In 2014, USO On Point featured Dr. Cooper as one of the veterans who have most influenced the lives of veterans through technology. Dr. Cooper holds 16 high achievement awards. This number may change if he receives another award after I recorded this video. In my own personal journey, I had an opportunity to work as a postdoctoral researcher under Dr. Cooper's leadership at Hull. This was the time in 2011 when Hull moved from VA to Bakery Square in Pittsburgh. In fact, I am wearing a t-shirt from Hull today. I still have fond memories of working on Smart Kitchen with Dr. Cooper and Dr. Ding Dang at Hull. With this, I would like to welcome Dr. Cooper to inspire us with his exceptional work on advancing technologies for people with disabilities. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, for sharing your time with us. All right, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Rory Cooper, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you. I'm going to be uh, talking about some of our advanced technology for rebuilt disabilities that we've been developing at the University of Pittsburgh and U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Human Engineering Research Laboratories. If you ever get the chance to uh, visit Pittsburgh, you're welcome to come and visit us. We're here located in Bakery Square, which is a research park uh, that uh, involves the University of Pittsburgh, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Google, and Phillips. Let me just show you a quick video. Totally and I really mean this is kind of like the chocolate factory. I get to play with robots and all these technologies. Our mission is to apply engineering and advanced technology to improve the mobility and function of individuals with disabilities. A large number of them are our veteran population. And every day that you come in, there's this kind of wonderful energy here from students, staff, faculty. We wouldn't really be living up to our our mission, if we didn't include people with disabilities in all aspects of what we do, our vision is a world where everyone with a disability can participate on a level playing field to their greatest extent possible. I've got a disability, you know. I certainly wouldn't think of myself as disabled, but it was having a huge impact on my life, on my wife, and my children. We can do better than that. We, we have to do better than that. So I work here because I want to give everyone an equal opportunity to whatever they want. Disability shouldn't be the thing that prevents them from getting those things. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a little video from, uh, from produced by Google. That's Matt Landis, who's a veteran, a person with a spinal cord injury that works in rural part of the time. Um, I'd like to leave you with a, start with a couple of messages. The um, I love this quote from Howard Rusk. Howard Rusk was a physician during World War II in charge of the military rehabilitation programs. And he might know him, he created the Rusk Institute in New York, which is a fairly well-known rehabilitation center. And he, um, in his autobiography, which is out of print but available online, um, recognized that people with disabilities uh, could contribute gainfully to employment. And he worked diligently during World War II to allow service members to continue on active duty. The other image in here is the uh, cover of IEEE Spectrum. IEEE is the Institute for Electrical Electronics Engineers Spectrum, which is their magazine, that engineers need more heroes. You know, we all know about movie heroes and uh, sports heroes, but we don't uh, necessarily know about engineering and scientists heroes. So 
Hopefully you'll know a little bit more by the end of this talk. And also, uh, I'm an engineer, an inventor, a person with disability, I'm a veteran. Um, and I think there's a, a you said you've shared with me one message they need for more inventors in the United States. We are not, we're falling behind in the United States for creating new inventors. And we need one way that we can expand inventors and increase in diversity. Get more women inventors, more people with disability inventors, and more people of color to be inventors. Um, we, uh, if you look, less than 50% of patents awarded in the United States now are by people from the United States. It's, uh, so it's pretty surprising. And if we look, there's a social impact of invention as well. But it, clearly, it's an economic driver. Uh, so we create new technologies, new inventions. Uh, intellectual property itself is a is a marketable item, and uh, uh, but we have a very limited pool of inventors in the United States. Um, for those of you who are just for fun, uh, you know, sometimes we think about people with disabilities as people with disabilities being a little bit one-sided. And uh, I wanted to share with you, you know, I'm a, a husband, I'm a brother, I'm a son, um, I'm an uncle, and I'm uh, a former Paralympic athlete, medalist, former world champion, world record holder, in uh, wheelchair racing, and uh, uh, and I'm a centerfold. And this is the October issue of uh, AARP magazine where I was the centerfold. Uh, and uh, uh, because uh, of an accident I had last year and about my recovery. And so um, it's just about getting people that are multi, multifaceted, multi sided. Uh, I also like to share with you the, you know, the importance of, of sharing with young people. Uh, I like this uh, particular story because. Whiz Pop Mag Bang Magazine is a magazine for middle schoolers uh, with a circulation of about a million middle schoolers around the world. And uh, each month they feature a scientist, engineer, or inventor from somewhere in the world uh, and try to relate that to something that middle schoolers might be doing. And this issue uh, was focused on the wheel and uh, how the wheel impacts our daily lives. And uh, it was fun that they chose to, to feature to feature me and to reach out to kids to inspire them to study science, engineering, mathematics. So I uh, also like to point out the importance of assistive technology. When I uh, talk to uh, students that in the health professions, especially in medicine, one thing I can tell them that they're guaranteed to provide that will help people to skills when they provide assistive technology. If you just think about, I wouldn't be able to present to you today if I didn't have a wheelchair for mobility, if I didn't have an adaptive home to live in, and I didn't have an adaptive vehicle to get to work in. And those is of the things you could do, you know, medications and surgeries don't necessarily always work. Assistive technology might not always work the first time, but assistive technology almost always works eventually and has a tremendous impact on people's lives. And um, we have a close relationship in our work at the Human Engineering Research Laboratories between uh, with the Center for Assistive Technology, which is a partnership between the University of Pittsburgh and the UPMC Health System. Also, I'd like to show you that my, my wife is vicariously joining us today. She's um, in the bottom picture there with the yellow jacket on. And one of the things I like about that particular picture is that with her is Dr. John Bay Kim, who was a student of mine, is now a professor at Yonsei University of Korea. And um, so most people might see that picture and think that Dr. Kim is actually Rosie's client, but she was, he's actually Rosie's colleague. Um, so I believe in this participatory action design and engineering paradigm, which means that people with disabilities and family members and clinicians um, have to be engaged throughout the entire process from conceptualization of challenges to overcome, uh, all the way into community participation in clinical practice guidelines. Um, now this, in this paradigm, we're really talking about more related to assistive technology and medical technology. Of all the, the common, really, um, user engagement is important for all areas of engineering and research, and I think is becoming particularly important as we move forward. Um, also, I'd like to show that there have been reports 
from both the National Academy of Medicine and the um, National Research Council and others that technology does promote social mobility, health and participation for individuals with disabilities. Um, but uh, there are barriers uh, for people with disabilities to participate in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM fields, which I think is actually the future. So that people with disabilities can actually be driving the process forward for uh, research, uh, scientific endeavors, or scientific discovery, as well as for clinical care. But they have to have access to a STEM education. And uh, one of the sad commentaries on the United States is that many kids with disabilities don't have uh, adequate opportunities to study STEM after middle school. And so they're often directed towards other uh, areas of study or not to study at all. And that's something that we need to work with. And a lot of that has to do with physical access uh, as well as access to equipment and use of equipment and uh, knowledge of teachers. So, so those are things that we all have to, to work together on to improve. And for our veterans population, we need to work on uh, improve, in the handoff for transition. So between the military when somebody gets wounded, injured, or ill, and then off to the VA, and into the private sector as well, because our veterans tend to use a mixed model for healthcare provision. They use the Department of Defense, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and they use the, the uh, public sector as well, uh, or the private sector as well for healthcare. So I mentioned uh, earlier our participatory action design and engineering paradigm. And uh, one of the things that we do in order to gather ideas is uh, we use a voice of the consumer uh, process. And this is just the results of, uh, of one of our voice of the consumer studies we've done several. Uh, and this is to help create a roadmap. So the uh, President's Research Advisory Council site recommended there be a roadmap for rehabilitation and disability research. Uh, the Department of Defense has called for such a roadmap. The Department of Veterans Affairs has called for such a roadmap. So we've sort of taken on this endeavor to some extent. Uh, and um, so we developed a large survey and validated it. Um, this is a sample we had about 1,000. We actually got to about 1,700 people finally. Uh, we are actually repeating this study in the area of uh, accessible, uh, transport, accessible autonomous transportation. But uh, um, the uh, people at the, uh, identified actually five interesting areas. First was this uh, participatory action design and research. And among those was uh, universal design, education, standards and dissemination knowledge translation. And I'll pick up on the dissemination of knowledge translation a little bit later. And then actually five, uh, four technical areas, uh, which are very interesting. Advanced wheelchair design, uh, and so better manual wheelchairs, more robotic wheelchairs, lighter weight, uh, more fitting to the individual's body, uh, smart device applications. So, you know, on nearly all of us carry a, some kind of smartphone technology, other smart, and now a lot more smart home technology as well, and how that can benefit people with disabilities as a crossover between commercial technology and assistive technology. Uh, and better human machine interfaces. Um, one of the, um, you know, my favorite, I think my most impactful research projects and resulted in the patent for the variable compliance joystick with compensation algorithms. And I'll, I'll mention that a little bit more later, but, you know, changing user interfaces can change people's lives tremendously. Um, voice to, you know, voice to text, for example, or text to voice is, is one that many people are familiar with. But uh, if you um, can, uh, you know, operate technology independently, that makes a huge uh, impact on people as well. And then assistive robotics and intelligence systems, which makes sense. As widespread use of machine learning and artificial intelligence and robotics technology, which I think is another area. I also think what's really cool about this is um, oftentimes scientists and engineers underestimate the knowledge of consumers. And they were actually aware of these pretty um, high-tech and advanced areas and recognized their importance for their future. 
Another interesting result is when we did that survey, we found people recommended a lot of technologies that actually commercially existed. And we did a, a partner study of clinicians. What I found surprising, somewhat shocking actually, was that both consumers and clinicians were not aware of many technologies that already exist commercially and are available. And so we decided to study that a bit further. So we studied several hundred people uh, in a separate survey to find out where do you get your information? And so if we just look at, and so we did this K-cluster analysis, which is a type of machine learning approach. And, uh, and we found, at least in the consumer population, sort of three groups, sort of we call engaged, dis disengaged, and people that rely on friends and family. And you can see from this slide some of the description about it. Uh, very interesting that the, uh, the people that relied heavily on friends and family were the non-veterans. And the veterans um, were both mixed between being engaged and disengaged. And uh, something that's somewhat contrary to what you read in other studies is that uh, the engaged population actually tended to be a little bit older, which normally you kind of hear about all, uh, older adults not being so engaged in information technology mm -hmm. or technology information gathering. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of our actual research projects. One of the things that we've been studying for years is, is wheelchair quality through the application of uh, a U.S. and international standards. Um, this, if you look on the upper left, on the left-hand side, those are the test machines commonly used, the multi-drum tester, the curb drop tester, the impact tester, and uh, strength, static strength tester. Those are, you know, not so important unless you're an engineer and you want to know what happens. Uh, What's more interesting about the upper right, those are the kind of failures that we see. We, a lot of those are uh, fatigue failures, uh, and most of those fatigue, fatigue failures means where you have repeated fail, something where you uh, think about when you want to tear a piece of paper. One of the things you can do is you can fold it and then flip it and fold it the other direction, do that several times, and then you can tear it fairly easily along the line. That's because of fatigue fractures. And you can see the same thing in metals. And so, and those typically happen for the same purposes. When you create a crease or an edge, it makes it easier for them to tear over time. And um, if you look at the yeah, item C up there, uh, you can see this kind of wave pattern. It looks like waves on the beach. And that's, you can see, that's a, a telltale sign of a fatigue type fracture. But what's more important is the, the image on the lower right. And that's the uh, um, Meyer Kaplan survival curve analysis. And what's interesting is there's a solid vertical line there. And on that solid vertical line here, that, um, that is actually the standard that all wheelchairs should pass in order to meet FDA standards. What you find interesting, if you look carefully, is that a lot of the wheelchairs actually failed before that line. And it really was only the ultralight aluminum wheelchairs and some of the titanium wheelchairs that Matt passed that line. What's a little bit disconcerting to, to me and others is all of these wheelchairs were on the market and approved already. So these are not prototypes, or, but these are wheelchairs that people are using. To help address some of those problems, one of the areas, one of the reasons that wheelchairs fail, besides some common design mistakes, like putting high stress having um, stress concentrations where there's a hole or a crack or a thread or some kind of groove. But um, a lot of the forces come through the casters, which makes sense. You drive most of the time in the forward direction. Uh, that means the sidewalk cracks, door thresholds, tree roots, those sort of things hit the casters first. And the caster wheels tend to be smaller. And so uh, they uh, are... So that means those uh, bumps are hit more towards the center line, which means they transmit more towards the frame. So we developed a device called the Oblique Angle Suspension Caster Fork. That's the name of the patent. But, of course, once it was licensed and became commercially available, it's sold as the Glide. And the Glide uh, helps uh, absorb some of those shocks using like a shock absorber. 
Uh, another interesting challenge we found out is that if you've ever taken a wheelchair out on a sidewalk, sidewalks tend to be sloped towards the, uh, toward the street for water to drain. And uh, it turns out that this, your arm on the side towards the street uh, has to push a lot harder to keep the wheelchair going straight. It can be a little bit easier if you move the axles forward because then the center of gravity of the person is more closely related to the axle. So the lever arm is shorter and the wheelchair has less of a tendency to want to go to the, to the downward side. But uh, so we developed a mechanism called the path lock, uh, which is on the left hand side of the image. And it basically a magnet or a, 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 a bell bearing in a, in a spring kind of bias the caster to go straight and it can make it much easier. What I found interesting, though, is when we got these in consumers' hands, not only did they use it to go longer distances, but more interestingly enough is people started to use them for one-arm drive wheelchairs because you could push with one hand and go straight, and then you could kind of push a little harder and unlock the bearing and turn and then go back and go straight again. But what also was very curious was how many people wanted them basically to take like a hot cup of coffee from one room to another so they could push with one hand and hold the cup in the other hand rather than place the cup on their lap and move. So even when you have a lot of experience, you can learn things from what consumers will do with them once they get them. Another uh, common problem is uh, rotator cuff injuries and carpal tunnel syndrome. So. Uh, 30 years ago, when we first started studying this problem, we actually studied it for two reasons. Uh, one, this is the racing chair smart wheel, which we use to help our U.S. Paralympic team prepare for the 2020 Paralympics, which are now been postponed to 2021. Uh, I originally invented this to go faster than the other competitors when I competed in the Paralympics in Seoul, Korea. Uh, although we later discovered that we built it for everyday use, you could... Um, help reduce rotator cuff injuries and carpal tunnel syndrome. So believe it or not, 30 years ago, about 80% of manual wheelchair users developed a rotator cuff injury or carpal tunnel syndrome within five years. And many people it reported that being a, a disability, being a more a, acquiring a second disability that was more severe than their original disability. And so we started to look at that and understand using the smart wheel how you could do that. So one way was to study, this is the bicep tendon, and look at swelling or tears in the bicep tendon. Now, one of the tricky parts is, how do you do that in real time? So how do you determine causality? How we did that is we, we worked with companies to develop high-speed ultrasound images, which was not something that actually existed at the time. But we worked with several commercial companies to develop that. The other challenge is... If, uh, if you've ever seen an ultrasound or had a, seen an ultrasound of a, like for example, a, a, a child in the womb, is that uh, it's hard to get two images that are the same to register those images. So we had to work on that as well. So that this little A-shaped thing is actually a piece of stainless steel. We use a little bit of colostomy cement and some tape, and we glue it on the person's body, and that allows us to that shows up on the ultrasound is these two bright lines. And that then allows us to get two images that are exactly the same in the same plane. And that then allowed us to look at uh, the tears, shape, and swelling of the biceps tendon, for example, in this image. Or to look at the median nerve in the, for carpal tunnel syndrome in the wrist. So they kind of look down the wrist that way. Uh, and so that allowed us to then look at causality. So how the wheelchair was set up, the type of wheelchair, and um, later to develop ergonomic push rims, which we see here, um, which we you know now are sold as the natural fit in the surge. Um, not this time. So, and the, so the good news of this whole story is it resulted in a clinical practice guideline for upper limb preservation and. Uh, it now, uh, the rate of carpal tunnel syndrome and rotator cuff injuries in individuals is around 20% within five years. 
which is a huge uh, in, improvement in quality of life as well as economic savings to the healthcare system. Uh, I don't think we can get much more below 20 percent um, through changes in the wheelchair because you still have transfers and transfers also put strain on the upper extremities. And so that's a technology that needs to be worked on as well. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that later. Another uh, challenge is what we discovered through our biomechanics work with the smart wheel was that if you were lighter weight, you were at less risk for developing carpal tunnel syndrome or rotator cuff injuries. Matter of fact, uh, from a biomechanics perspective or an ergonomics perspective, if you only learn one lesson, don't gain weight, right? The heavier you are, the more risk, more risk you are for, um, for um, metabolic diseases as well as for like diabetes or as well as for um, upper extremity injuries. So we started to study that problem, and this is our real fit app. And uh, the challenge was um, how do you uh, – coach people to take better care of themselves. And uh, also, uh, how do you provide them actual coaching, not just reminders? So uh, we worked on early, I, I'll, I'll show you a couple slides on different technologies about virtual coaching. And because most people previously to that just simply gave people reminders. Well, reminders aren't simply enough. As a matter of fact, they actually turn out to be ineffective after a while. Uh, because they start to feel like nagging. You want to be doing coaching and not nagging. Uh, the other thing that I found interesting about that is if you look on the lower right-hand side, you see these graphs of the day of the week, and this is the accumulation of data from about 60 people. And you see that the light blue is people sleeping, and then the, the uh, other blue is sedentary activity, not, not doing very much movement at all. And then the, the creamy yellow color is really when people are doing moving a little bit, but not enough to generate exercise. And red is actually exercise. There's funny thing about this. So these people were given the wheel fed app. They were monitored. They knew what we were studying them. And um, you see there's on Thursdays, there's this red area. And that's when the graduates do what they visit them, right? So people, obviously, they exercised because they knew they were going to get a face-to-face -face visit. What does, I guess, in one say, the personalized coaches or personal trainers probably do have some effect. Um, but that uh, there's a challenge to virtual coaching that people still, it's hard to break. Old habits die hard, basically. So another thing you're probably familiar with is that um, – as I mentioned, the increased weight loss, uh, weight increases, and metabolic disease are unfortunately too common among people with disabilities, and people, especially people with mobility impairments. And one thing that every weight loss program has in common is the ability to weigh yourself and track your weight. But many people with mobility impairments don't have the ability to weigh themselves or track their weight. And uh, when we ask people, they often have only weighed themselves once a year, or maybe every couple of years. You know, my wife tells a funny story about a person who was a, a postal worker, and he uh, uh, came in for a wheelchair, and she asked how much he weighed, and, and his wife uh, sort of chuckled and said, uh, honey, I don't think you weighed that little in a long time. And uh, so uh, my wife said, uh, it's okay. And we understand it's just like the post office. That's your forever weight, <laughs> like your forever stamp. And so, uh, um, and that, but that gives an opportunity to educate the importance about knowing your weight and managing your weight. And so one of the things we worked on is uh, a bed scale that actually fits underneath the feet of the bed. Um, I like the pictures on the lower left because it kind of shows Pearl's ability to build quality prototypes in large numbers, which allow us to do studies where we can actually uh, test, you know, 50, 100, even sometimes a thousand people, and uh, and get really sort of definitive data rather than testing just ones and twos. Uh, and also, the quality of the prototype makes a real difference 
in people's perceptions and their willingness to participate in the study and to eventually adopt that technology. And so uh, interesting what it does is basically put a scale that they're all connected under the feet of four feet of the bed. And then from that, we can get the person's weight. We had to use some artificial intelligence and machine learning because if there was two people in bed, we have to separate their weight or if the dogs was in bed. Had some other interesting uh, uh, benefits to it. For example, uh, we could see how often the person got up at, in the night or how often they rolled over in bed if they needed to reposition. And so uh, it, you can actually get a fair amount of information about it. We hope that that will uh, change people's health. So the, the virtual student coach was developed uh, basically in order to meet the critical need that we had identified of people getting power wheelchairs and power seat functions, but their uh, condition uh, not, not improving. And so uh, we did a series of experiments to identify that people would use their power seat functions and not necessarily as instructor. The idea with the virtual seating coach was to use the advances in technology uh, the first onboard computing, uh, later with a, a smartphone technology, to uh, provide that coaching in real time, contextually aware, uh, all the time available to the user, and provide that data to the cloud once so those algorithms could be improved based on what was learned, as well as share that data with clinicians in order to improve their clinical practice and eventually improve our clinical practice guidelines. And ultimately, the goal is that we use the technology interacting with the user to uh, help the user get, get the maximum benefit from the technology they're using. So that was for power wheelchairs and largely based on using the powered seat functions effectively. Uh, we're also working on similar technology for uh, manual wheelchair users. The challenge the manual wheelchair virtual coach is that you have to get the person to uh, voluntarily reposition themselves. So to a wheelchair push-up or lean forward or lean sideways uh, for a sufficient time that will actually, uh, not a sufficient duration as well as sufficient angle or lift off in order to reduce uh, capillary pressure and allow the blood to return and get um, reduced pressure injuries. So um, we've been using some uh, AI-based instruction machine learning, basically putting a, a lightweight sensor uh, under the seat to measure the center of pressure. And from that center of pressure and the weight, we can um, help two things. We can get people can actually be weighed in their wheelchair at any time, and uh, we can help coach them to, uh, to reduce pressure injury risk. The other thing about it is it could be cloud-connected so they can share that data with their clinician or a family member or another a friend to kind of motivate each other to help reduce the risk together. Now, some people, uh, despite those technologies, either have the have the inability or um, to uh, re to to move their uh, pressure to alter their pressure. So we've been working with the University of Texas Applied Research Institute to uh, develop an active cushion that uh, relieves pressure as well. So, uh, the, and we used a, uh, an instrumented uh, buttocks, and uh, this is actually the cushion here on the upper right. And then uh, we if you compare it to just pressure mapping, I actually think that the cushion sensors that uses um, pneumatic sensors, that's actually more accurate than a pressure mapping system. Um, and. And if you know anything about how pressure distribution, you can look at the two shapes. That's a, from a pressure mat, and that's the internal pressure. This is a, that even makes more sense, really. Um, but uh, so we had a person sit on it, and then we used a standard sort of offloading algorithm, which you might do passively. In other words, lowering the pressure in certain cells. Um, but then we used an AI algorithm to redistribute the load to minimize it at any uh, over the entire surface. What you can see is there's there's low, no red, less green, uh, and almost all, in all different shades of, mostly shades of blue, which is good. Blue is low pressure. Um, what's also good about this redistribution algorithm is it's dynamic. 
So if you move around, it redistributes the pressure. And it can do that because all of these cells are individually controlled. Hi, my name is Joshua Zhong. I am a researcher at the Human Engineering Research Lab. My research project is focused on the performance evaluation and the user interface of the assistive robotic indicators. So the assistive robotic arms is that a robotic arm can be mounted on wheelchairs and uh, that can assist uh, wheelchair users or people with a disability to do uh, some daily tasks uh, using the computer interface. So, so the reason we developed the interface is that uh, we have tests with the current uh, robotic original interfaces and uh, a lot of users have difficulty running those uh, here and some memorize the keys or memorize the command or combination of uh, different keystrokes. So the interface we de developed kind of a reduce those uh, frustration so they can quickly learn how to control the robot and they can do the task from just um, within a minute. There was one veteran who kept our robot and he's so, so he was so excited and he, he said, he just point to the robot and, and say to the, the caregiver, that's what I want. So I, I think the robot would be really helpful for people sitting in a chair and still want to achieve something for their lives. So one of the other techniques that we use quite frequently is additive manufacturing. You might know it better as, as 3D printing. And uh, so uh, this is a, a not really a study, but an example of where this could become advantageous. So um, you can see Rosie in the background again. Uh, she brought Alec to us. Alec was a participant using one of our robotic arms that we were working with uh, Jayco on. And uh, he wanted to use a, a, the robotic arm so he could gain some independence. So Alec has a, a severe um, cerebral palsy and has the inability to um, to, to eat by himself, to lift objects off the floor, or even manipulate them, except in a very small, uh, within a small workspace. The other interesting thing is that Alec had a challenge using his own phone. So you used to often have to ask somebody to give it to them or have to have it very precisely positioned. And so uh, when Alec came to us, we uh, developed a phone, uh, an interface for him for both his phone and the robotic controller that's custom for Alec. And so this is a computer aided design drawings. And then we were able to 3D print that and uh, put Alec's phone in there and then uh, um, use this as the controller. These are the buttons and that's kind of a short throw mini joystick, which by the way, has its origins in my research at California and at early in Hurl with what I mentioned earlier with the uh, variable compliance joystick. And so uh, through that, Alec was able to, uh, um, to independently use the robot and actually eat and drink for the first time by himself. So um, it's pretty hard to put a price on that. Um, I often tell people that uh, I get paid most frequently in smiles and tears. And so um, uh, we're working now to try to get this covered by Alec's insurance. Uh, I literally had a meeting yesterday uh, try to argue his case uh, again, so hopefully we'll eventually succeed. On the positive note that the VA does cover this technology, and so there's a gathering evidence that it does it is effective. And uh, while we don't have veterans with cerebral palsy, we do have veterans with traumatic brain injuries that uh, result in conditions that are similar to cerebral palsy, as well as veterans with ALS and MS and spinal cord injuries and, uh, and strokes. So we're hopeful that... Uh, that gaining evidence for gathering through the VA will help translate into the private sector and get this type of technology approved.
because I don't think it, it not only improves quality of life, it improves health, right? If you can um, manage some of your own activities of daily living. Hey, good evening, DAV. Dan Clare, I'm here at the National Disabled Veterans Winter Sports Day, a great, great event that we do with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and, and I'm here in a room where very important things happen at this event every year. Human Engineering Research Laboratories, in partnership with the VA and the University of Pittsburgh, they do this great research every year that changes the lives of veterans way beyond the event. They're testing wheelchairs, they're testing um, transfers, things like that. They're doing research that changes veterans' lives every day. And one of the great things we have here is past DAV National Commander, Dave Riley, and, and DAV's, uh, DAV's event ambassador, and Dr. Rory Cooper, a great friend of DAV with Human Engineering Research Laboratories, Dr. Cooper, thank you so much. Dave Riley, as you can see, uh, is a quadruple amputee, so Dave's, Dave doesn't have, doesn't have hands, and that makes a little bit difficult, especially for someone with a computer science background, to operate a mouse. So last year, Dave talked to Dr. Cooper. They got together and they came up with this device. Tell us about it, Dr. Cooper. Yeah, it's, uh, it's basically an adapted computer mouse that uh, we designed and actually patented uh, to uh, be compatible with a prosthetic hook. So it's got like a, like Dave's using right now, it's got kind of a dead zone virtual phone that has the left button, right button. Or left click, right click. It allows you to also drag and click, but also drag and click. Yeah, right click. Um, so that you can use the mouse just like anybody else. Dave, how's it different for you to try and use? Oh, it's much better than, you know, I, I used to use uh, the eye, eyeglasses with the uh, you know, traction of pupils and then you use voice assistant. This is just like using the mouse again. It's very you know, normal. We found on the mouse pad we're going to do something with the you know, the buttons right here, we're going to tighten up that little hole there, so it's not as much more but this, this will work. It's just a little... So it's exciting about that is oftentimes that we get asked, you know, you introduce these technologies, you know, are they affordable? And they, they kind of, so, you know, that example with Dave is, uh, he, you know, we took a technology that costs like four or $5,000 and brought it down to about $25. Um, or even the virtual seating coach that you saw, that that's actually for free, right? You see it's part of the system. Um, this is a, a, an interesting, another kind of interesting project. Uh, this uh, patient, Walter E. came to us and said, you know, we're having a lot of our veterans here that have a multiple limb amputations or severe burns or limb trauma, and uh, they can't use the button on the patient-controlled anesthesia device. And so they are in pain and they call for the nurses. And so we worked with the manufacturer and the FDA and they said, well, as long as you don't actually modify the switch, then you can just make these and put them. And so we used 3D printing to make a sheath to go around the switch and, uh, and that this could be mounted like an easy button on the person's bed and they could operate with their shoulder or their foot or their elbow or their leg or Whatever they had, they could move around, and the nurses were able to install them. And uh, it's pretty interesting. We had them at Walter Reed, then they wound up going to Brook Army Medical Center, and then they wound up going to Balboa in San Diego, and then uh, in the VA as well. And so, uh, fortunately, the number of uh, severe casualties has decreased, but uh, uh, we wound up making these for several hospitals, and we still get a few requests for these as well. Um, and now we, of course, uh, also use it for uh, making ergonomic um, hand cycle pedals, which multi-configuration to help reduce uh, injuries and also make this sport more accessible for more people with disabilities. Even in the kitchen, where something as simple as preparing meals can be a real challenge. This kitchen is designed for people with Alzheimer's and brain injury. This is the QE kitchen where specially designed computer programs provide cues or step-by-step -step instructions for cooking things like pasta. When I click next, the program will give me my first instruction on, on how to get started with making pasta. Take out cooking pot from the lighted cabinet.
take out a pasta from the transparent cabinet, fill the cooking pot with water from the water faucet, turn the faucet off, place cooking pot on the stove, turn on the stove, This program is ideal for someone with cognitive or memory loss problems. But for those who need more help, there's this futuristic device called the Kitchen Bot. The Kitchen Bot can turn a faucet on and off. It can also open cabinets and drawers and operate appliances. It's a sophisticated instrument that moves up, down, and sideways and can be programmed for specific or group of functions. Also for... Um, as I mentioned earlier, transfers are a significant challenge. And so this is our strong arm or the robotic assisted transfer device, which can lift up to uh, 200 pounds and uh, help safely move a person from their wheelchair to another surface without having the uh, caregiver to do a lot of lifting. And as like you see here is that uh, the, per that the uh, assistant um, can remain pretty close to the person, in this case a dummy, but you can see on the left-hand side images of transferring a person, and uh, which makes the whole process much more comfortable for everyone than using this sort of a standard lift device. And uh, the nice thing about it, mounts to the wheelchair can be trans, it can go in the, behind the wheelchair until you can, uh, doesn't take any more of the space or any more of the footprint. And it can be on the left or the right side of the wheelchair and drive basically on a track from one side to the other to facilitate transfers depending on what's needed in the space available. And uh, which allows you to take this to a shopping mall or uh, to a friend's house or to a hotel or something like that where you wouldn't necessarily be able to take a large lift device, separate lift device. And if you want to, you can actually drive it off the track and put it in a suitcase and take it with you as that way as well. For some people, um, they, they need even more assistance than that. So we've been working on a zero lift transfer or power page transport system is what we call it. So this is a power wheelchair that's been adopted to interface with the hospital bed, and we've changed the movement of the hospital bed and the wheelchair. So basically, with the use of a smartphone or a tablet, the, the two coordinate each other. The program's a little bit off here, I'll admit, where we've improved that since this video was taken, but um, the, there's no lifting involved. And basically, the wheelchair kind of pours the person into bed and the conveyor sort of helps suck them into bed at the same time. What's nice about this is that uh, you don't, um, there's no lifting, no putting the sling underneath the person. And there's studies that have shown, especially in uh, long-term care facilities, even at home, the ability to get in and out of bed uh, and be mobile during the day actually helps reduce the risk of, uh, of long-term health consequences. And uh, and also reduce the risk to, in this way, into health, to family caregivers or healthcare workers. So, and, and, and the nice thing about that conveyor is that it allows the person to reposition themselves in bed, and you can reverse the process to get out of bed. We also added the uh, bed scales that I mentioned earlier so that the person could be weighed in bed as well. And then we can use that, and it's all cloud connected. So we can not, so if this was an old, long-term care facility or in a hospital, for example, you could actually record how many times a person got repositioned, uh, what their weight changes were, how many times they got in and out of bed, which are all important metrics for um, indirect metrics for a person's health. So I mentioned the variable compliance joystick with compensation algorithms that's, that we patented. So one of the, the fun things about that is that uh, um, prior to this technology becoming available. So the VA patented this and then licensed it to any wheelchair company that wanted it as a royalty-free license. The idea was to keep one company from owning this technology and blocking others from using it. 
and as well as the VA to get a little bit of credit. But the main thing was is that right, what I found very interesting is prior to this time, there were um, literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who used manual wheelchairs uh, that were propelled by a family member or a friend or a caregiver. And uh, they didn't have independent mobility. So I remember um, at that time, I, would, I did a lot more consulting uh, with clients at the Center for Assistive Technology. And it, it really aggravated me that, that people would get uh, manual tilt and recline wheelchairs because they couldn't operate a powered wheelchair independently. And, uh, um, you know, of course, your mobility is very limited if you ever have to rely on somebody else. And so we, uh, after this technology was uh, became widely available, it was, the transformation was remarkable. Um, there were literally, there were so many people that the number of power wheelchairs that Medicare uh, provided in the net over the, after this technology became commercially available, went up by fourfold. So I even got called to come in and testify to the Medicare Medicaid services to ask them what had happened, to, to explain to them what had happened. And basically, it wasn't anything nefarious. What had happened was there was this huge pent up demand of people who were dependent on others for mobility, for mobility that a new technology came out that they could have independent mobility by simply being able to uh, program the sensitivity of the joystick or program the axes of the joystick or the filtering of the joystick and controlling things like the, uh, the, the speed, the acceleration, the braking, the turning, all of those sort of things. Uh, the other interesting thing was, um, for those that have been around for a while, uh, like myself, we used to make templates out of plastic or metal uh, for people that had uh, needed guidance for going straight, left or right, or they couldn't actually go orthogonal. So, it, And they had to, we call those bias axes, uh, in engineering at least. And um, so we make these templates and put them on their joystick. So this became electronically available. And you could have all kinds of templates and custom templates for individuals basically programmed, today they're actually programmed with your phone, right? The, the supplier comes in and does all of this programming with their, with their phone. And actually some sophisticated users have downloaded and do it themselves and uh, can tune it. The other thing that we did is um, it has uh, the capability, it, we explained how you could adjust these features over the course of a day. So if you had individuals with, with multiple sclerosis or something like that where they may actually be uh, pretty capable in the morning, but as they fatigued in the afternoon, their, their control parameters needed to change. And uh, that what is a lot, uh, the biggest group was actually the older adults that had tremor or other problems. And um, they were able to drive independently. It was pretty remarkable. And it's one of my, uh, my prouder accomplishments. So this is kind of fun. Um, we, uh, this is our personal mobility manipulation appliance. It is the, was the first fully robotic wheelchair with bimanual manipulation. So two robotic arms all coordinated together. And, uh, this experiment, we had Elaine, who was one of our undergraduate students, later became a graduate student. She, um, and she and others, we asked them to, we gave them some money, asked them to go to a local store and buy some items. And just to see how the robot worked, we also coordinated with social scientists, which was fun about that was we asked the social scientists to observe how the other shoppers and the people in the store reacted to having a robot in the store. Um, what, we, were, we were pleasantly, um, we were pleased with two outcomes. One, the uh, robot worked rather well, and having two arms is beneficial, and Elaine is controlling with voice and with a tablet. And uh, the other thing is, as you can see on checkout, uh, the, this person is completely naive to the study, responds very well and very naturally. And that was pretty much uniformly the response. Um, we only had to, we had to make one small change in the protocol, which was interesting. 
And if you're very observant, you might have noticed it. And that was Elaine actually gave the clerk her wallet first and then the items. Now, normally you'd give the items and then give the wallet. But when we did that, people got free stuff. They were like, oh, no, 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 that's so cool. Just keep it. I'll pay for it. And, of course, we... And there, I guess there are benefits to that, but we didn't want to take advantage of people's good nature. And so we changed the protocol a little bit. So we had them the wallet first and then had them the items. But it was kind of a neat, neat thing. Now, of course, someday you'd hope that it would not be so cool that people would just naturally respond and treat you like everybody else. So this is uh, Dr. Kim again. Um, he came to visit us. And this is our uh, MeBot, the Mobility Enhancement Robotic Wheelchair. And uh, what's, um, we've been working on this for some time, but uh, it, uh, it has the ability to climb um, curbs up to eight inches high. And what it's cool about it is, you can see Dr. Kim has no hand function and he had just a little bit of arm function. He's able to uh, climb, uh, ascend and descend stairs. One of the things we did is basically we put all the actuators you normally have in the power seat functions in the base. So you still have tilt and recline, even have lateral tilt, and you have anterior tilt as well as posterior tilt, and you get elevation, so you can have an eye-level conversation. So, um, so probably as you can see, as he came off the curb, he and Dr. Cadiati were basically able to have an eye-level conversation. So you can do this basically get all these features without added expense. So it can cost in the same price range commercially as another power chair. The other thing is that uh, it can be on demand, a front wheel, mid wheel, or rear wheel drive, which has the advantages of it for indoor mobility, outdoor mobility in different circumstances. Um, so we're, um, we're pretty excited about this as well. I like this picture on the, on the lower right. It's one of my favorite. Um, that's uh, Chongbei, Siva, and Zen, and they were all students of mine, all of them with severe spinal cord injuries. Uh, um, Bei and, and Zen and are both uh, now have their PhDs or, and are professors, one in Korea, one in Germany, and uh, hopefully Civil will be a professor in the, few, in the, in the near future, uh, and he hopes to go back to the UK, so it'd be pretty cool that I'll have had um, students with severe disabilities as professors in um, three different countries, among, among the many others. But. So um, also, we, this, this is the same MEBOP, but I want to show you the other feature because of this ability, uh, we can uh, self-level sideways. So if you're on a ramp or something like that. So a lot of tips and falls that happen in power wheelchair users happen for two cases. This is one of them. They're going down the sidewalk, somebody steps in front of them, and one wheel goes off the curb and they fall into the street. And so, with our knee pot, this is kind of a, shows you that it stays level. You notice, see how it, it got basically one wheel on the curb and one wheel below the curb and it stays up the entire time. So this way, if that happened to a person, or they misjudge a curb cut, for example, or, or you can do it. The other one actually happens is when people go to a ramp transition like that, then uh, uh, they, they tip forward out of the chair. And so um, here they have the self-leveling um, side from front to back, essentially. So the person stays level the entire time. What's cool is you get Remember, you get the curb climbing and soft leveling all with the same chair, basically with the same features, right? Just different controls. Water is an obstacle. We generally avoid water marks because we know there's the ladder scaffold. You have to get up to the slide. And also, the rides in the water parks typically be, or just aren't good for someone without balance. So that's just in general, water parks and challenge. And being in a power wheelchair makes it even more difficult. 
these wound tears run on electricity, and when water comes in contact with them, the results can be shocking. So how do you build a water park that all kids can enjoy? That's the question Gordon Hartman had. He runs the world's first accessible theme park, Morgan's Wonderland in San Antonio. We had to come up with a wheelchair that would uh, allow for it to get wet and still be able to move about uh, through the use of someone's uh, ability to uh, use a joystick. That's when he discovered the work of Dr. Rory Cooper at the University of Pittsburgh School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Dr. Cooper is world-renowned for numerous patents and inventions when it comes to wheelchair technology. He's dedicated his life to improving assistive devices for people with disabilities. I found Dr. Cooper from the first conversation we had on the phone as a person who really wanted to work hard at ensuring that this idea that we had of developing this chair, which would truly be revolutionary. Garden Island Sandwich, and that's a, a, a world where all everybody can participate together. So the people with and without disabilities are on the same playing field. And the idea is, hey, an air mother with air tanks, if it's feasible, may uh, provide with a much lighter power chair, uh, much more environmentally friendly that doesn't need to have the batteries replaced. And from that idea, a new chair, short for pneumatic chair, was born. The new chair is powered strictly by compressed air. There's no batteries, so that makes it waterproof. We can recharge it in as little as 10 minutes. Unlike current battery wheelchairs, that could take up to eight hours. It could revolutionize the wheelchair industry. Brandon Daedler, a current graduate student at Pitt School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, is a researcher studying under Rory Cooper. Their team works out of the human engineering research laboratories where they modeled and built the new chair. The chair that makes a challenging trip to the water park, well, fun. I like to have the freedom to run around. It was rewarding to see just how he lit up and the enjoyment that he got out of going through the sprinklers and the water. He wants to be independent. Quite frankly, we let him go for 30 minutes by himself. And that's what he wants. And Rory thinks children without disabilities who witness this independence will be influenced too. That's the kind of experiences we want kids to have so that when they grow up, they don't have those biases and they can say, hey, oh, hell, I've, you know, I've seen people with disabilities do it just like I have. The positive influence of the new chair doesn't stop there. The granting agencies and the clinical work sort of force you to think about in a lot of form the medical aspects of life. And um, it, was, it, was, it was great to see how much uh, demand and energy there was for um, just having fun. I've already seen. Uh, uh, how this chair has made a difference in the lives of those with special needs. The reason we are where we are today is because of Pitt, the commitment of Dr. Gordy Cooper, and all his close staff and everyone involved who have made the dream of this chair possible. And I think in many ways we're just beginning. I hope it expands through water parks. I mean, we've been contacted by different, the National Park Service, the state parks, or putting it at uh, wave pools, beaches. I also think, uh, you know, it's got a lot of potential for, still for long-term care facilities and nursing homes, big box stores, or we have grocery stores and things contact us. Gives us hope that one day we won't have to worry about any type of barriers in our world. So actually, um, we mentioned uh, in the video, before we even realized that Giant Eagle then approaches, which is the local grocery store in Western Pennsylvania, and so we made a, a, a scooter version and uh, uh, running experiments in Giant Eagle stores. One of the reasons they're excited about it is, want the waterproof so when people drive the electric scooters and leave them in the parking lot, they would get damaged, and uh, that we don't, that's not a problem for our technology. Um, and secondly, it's greener and uh, the Giant Eagle stores are trying to become more environmentally friendly as well. Uh, for example, getting rid of plastic shopping bags and things like that. So, um, and people are very positive about it. It's pretty, pretty exciting uh, technology. So the fun thing is all that, uh, you know, you, I mentioned early on the ability about motivating others to become inventors and, and uh, inspiring them. And so, uh, I was fortunate to be selected by the U.S. Department of Commerce for a U.S. Patent and Trademark Office uh, trading card. And 
I'm uh, one of 28 people so far recognized in the history of the United States. Um, there's some people on there you might recognize, Thomas Edison, Nicholas Tesla, Abraham Lincoln, that have been honored uh, in the past with such a trading card as well. And so hopefully that will inspire uh, young, new generations to great technology. But I think is most exciting about this is that assistive technology and rehab engineering were recognized as fields that are just as important as, you know, the light bulb or the alternating current engine or, or uh, barges for the Mississippi or other technologies. Uh, um, Steve Wozniak for their personal computer. And so it's, it's pretty cool that um, I think is a field that we got uh, recognized. And as you might be aware, Temple Grandin is also a person with disabilities, so it's awesome to, to see that uh, people with disabilities are also recognized. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I, I appreciate the chance to speak with you today.